Good evening, I'm Yvonne Staff for Science for the Public and I welcome you to our Science Literacy Series at MIT. Our speaker tonight is Dan Sitzo, Associate Professor of Atmospheric Chemistry in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at MIT. And Dr. Sitzo also serves in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. He's an expert on the relationship between clouds and climate, a major focus of climate research. Dr. Sitzo has also been involved in major atmospheric uh, missions for NASA and he's received numerous rewards and I'd like to say also he is responsible for giving us this space for this lecture series and we thank him very much. In this talk tonight, Dr. Tsitso will address the issue of climate change, but with an emphasis on geoengineering, specifically on the current advocacy for geoengineering as a sol solution for climate change and the inattention to the side effects of geoengineering. It's now very important for climate scientists to inform the public about the hard reality of climate change and the inherent complications of geoengineering. And we appreciate Dr. Sitzo's commitment to provide clear information for the general public. He is, by the way, a wonderful translator of technical information for non-experts. We are very honored to welcome Dr. Tsitso tonight. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, I wanted to start by saying thank you to uh, Yvonne for uh, having me out. I've uh, had a great joy working with Science for the Public. I realized that it's been uh, almost five years since we first met. Um, and I've had the pleasure of giving lectures on climate and planetary atmospheres. Um, and in speaking recently, we realized that this topic of geoengineering has become a big story in the news recently, um, that there's a lot of misconceptions out there. And so what I'm really hoping to do tonight is talk through the science behind geoengineering. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the night, I, I hope that you guys can make your own decision about being proponents of this, um, perhaps drawing a line in the sand that, that you don't think it's a good idea, or which aspects of it you think are reasonable and which you don't think are reasonable. So I, I, I really hope that we can educate uh, ourselves over the course of, of the evening to do that. So uh, the idea behind geoengineering, um, in a general sense, is manipulating something about our planet that we don't like. Um, and so to, to start out with the topic of, of geoengineering in, in contemporary uh, news, um, that really has to do with the climate of our planet. Um, and so to, to get started tonight, I'd, I'd just like to show a couple of figures and talk through the basics of climate science to give you guys an understanding of what it is that we don't like about our planet right now and how we might think about changing that. Um, so this is, you know, the state of the climate. It's a bit like, you know, the state of the state or, or, the, or the state of the U.S. Um, so, so where is the climate at right now? Um, this data is, is from one of the last large reports. This is the 2013 uh, Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change Report. Um, so this is data from about the year 1900 to the year 2012. And you can see by the heat bar on this, this expresses when uh, in, in a certain area of the world the temperature is higher or lower than it was in the year 1900. And I think it's, it's pretty obvious that you can see across the vast majority of the surface of the planet um, that the temperature is higher. In a globally averaged sense, so the temperature everywhere averaged over the year, the temperature of the planet's about 0.75 degrees C warmer. Um, over land alone, it's about twice that, 1.5 degrees warmer. Um, and, and that's relative to 1880. Uh, this is largely attributed to CO2, an increase in a greenhouse gas that we have in the climate, uh, in the climate system. It's past 400 parts per million a couple years ago, so we can wave by to 400 parts per million. It is unlikely in our lifetime that we'll probably see uh, under 400 parts per million. Before the Industrial Revolution started, we have very good evidence to show that it was about 280 parts per million. And that's typically where it is during the recent interstitial periods, the periods between ice ages. So as a result of that, we can think about what the average temperature of the planet is on a yearly basis. So these are the warmest years on record. 
Uh, so number one is 2016, 2015, 2014. You're going to notice a trend here. There's a lot of 2000s on there. This is all the way back uh, records to the 1880s when we first had accurate thermometers on the planet. Um, you don't see many 1800s on there, early 1900s on there. They're really all within the lifetime of the folks in the room here. And so one of the things that I'm fond of saying is that when we talk about our children seeing a different climate than the one we're in, hello, the climate now is different than the climate that we all grew up in. The years that, you know, the first couple decades of my life are not represented on that figure there. The, only the last couple decades are in the 20 warmest years. Uh, just last month, we got the final data for 2017, and that would check in at number two on this figure. So I need to update this uh, shortly. If we use things like temperature proxies, tree rings, that type of data, we can go back further in time. And it's very, very likely that the temperature now is greater than it has been in, in thousands of years. So if it was just CO2, we would probably have a very good handle on the climate now and projecting it into the future. But we're not quite that sure yet. And one of the reasons is um, what, something that I'm going to try to show here. So this is a real image of the Earth, or more correctly, it's a real mosaic of images from the Earth. Uh, this is a poster I had up in, uh, on, on my wall when I was a kid from the Japanese Space Agency. Um, and of course, what's missing from this if you were really looking at the Earth from space? Clouds. Thank you. So it doesn't really look like that. If you take a single image and you don't sort of cherry pick images and knit them together, that's what the Earth should look like at any one time. And so why do I mention this in the aspect of climate? Well, those clouds are very, very reflective. So they're going to be sending some radiation back to space. About 30% of all of the photons that get to the Earth from the sun are actually reflected back into space by ice, by other reflectivity, by clouds, and by particles. And so at the same time as we've been increasing greenhouse gases and causing a warming of the planet, we've also been doing things that are causing a cooling of the planet, sort of offsetting some of that warming. So this is Singapore from a few years ago. Um, this is a pall of smoke over, over Singapore. And so what you can see here is that some of those photons we just talked about that are coming in from the sun, this is otherwise should be a bright blue clear day. Um, but you see this hazy image that's been taken. And that's because some of these photons are actually striking those particles that are in the atmosphere and being reflected back into space. This is what we as scientists call the direct effect of particles, their direct impact on radiation. You can say, well, particles are natural, so why are you showing us this image? These are not natural particles. These are fires that were set to clear land, specifically peat bogs so that they could be used for agricultural purposes. So these are fires that were set by humans to clear land for land use changes. And these are particles that are participating in the radiative balance that are there only because of us. So that's the direct effect that these particles have. So if we acknowledge that we as humans are changing particles, we're changing climate in a cooling sense. We're changing the albedo, the reflectivity of our planet. Those particles are also important because they act as the seeds on which droplets and ice crystals form. So if we change particles, we affect the climate directly, but we also change cloud cover. And we call this indirectly affecting climate. We create more clouds, or we change the reflectivity of the clouds that are there. This is one example of how that could happen. On the left-hand side, this is sort of a pre-industrial atmosphere. Only a few particles. We as humans haven't started putting particles there. There's some water vapor. The particles that are there pick up that water vapor and form a cloud. On the right, we have that same cloud post-industrial activities. Many more particles, the same amount of water. That water spread out over a lot more particles, so the particles are smaller. They don't gravitationally settle. They don't precipitate as fast. And those particles reflect more radiation. It's a brighter, a whiter cloud, so more reflectivity. So these things contribute to the enhanced albedo of the planet. And thanks to Yvonne, uh, we had a chance to do some demonstrations uh, for a few videos. And so that's the YouTube link on here that will be available on the slide. So uh, take a look at it and another plug for science for the public. So we, as climate scientists, can add all of these things together. We can take the greenhouse gas warming, and then we're going to put an error bar for how certain we are about that. We can take the other anthropogenic forcings, these particles, the clouds that are being created, we can put an error bar on that. By the way, you'll notice that that error bar is larger than the one on the greenhouse gases. We can add those together and get a combined forcing. 
We can try to equate that with the observed warming of the planet. You'll notice that the two are, are pretty similar. We're doing a pretty good job of understanding climate, but there's still some errors. If it's towards the low end of that error bar or the set of errors, we might project climate in the future, a few decades into the future, incorrectly. We might say that the temperature is going to be lower than it actually is. If it's towards the high end, we could have the opposite problem. We could underpredict the amount of change. So understanding that and shrinking those error bars is really critical to projecting climate into the future. Two other things that we'll circle back to at the very end are that natural forcings and natural internal variability, um, think of this as being the heat of the Earth changing over a long period of time, the orbital mechanics of the system changing over the period of this, the decades or century that we're talking about, changing and affecting the climate. Those things are perturbations. They can change the climate of the planet but they can't do it over a period of decades or a century. And so that's why you don't see much there. There's, there's some uncertainty on that, but there's not a measured effect. It can't rival what we as humans have done in terms of greenhouse gases and in terms of particles. Okay. So that's a, a very brief introduction with our first 10 minutes or so, just to get the stage set for the state of where our climate's at right now. So now we enter this idea of, of geoengineering. And to explain geoengineering, we actually have to go back a little bit earlier to a term that you guys may have heard, um, especially in fiction, which is terraforming. So terraforming is this idea that we can change something about a planet to make it more Earth-like. So the classic case of terraforming that we as humans think about is, is Mars. So this is supposed to be Mars in the present day. We somehow find a way to warm up the Martian uh, climate system. We start to melt a lot of the water that's there. We melt the polar caps. You end up with oceans on Mars, for example. So that's terraforming. Um, this actually goes back uh, to a novel called Collision Orbit from the 1940s, one of these little serial novels uh, from an author named Jack Williamson. But if you really think about it, we can go back yet further in science fiction. So if anybody has ever read War of the Worlds, um, hopefully you didn't see the really terrible movie with Tom Cruise in it. Um, but the original H.G. Wells book is actually quite good. And the concept here is that the Martians are trying to Mars form the Earth, right? They're, they're coming here and they want to make it more Martian so that they can live there. Same idea as terraforming, but, but going in a slightly different direction. So you can think about this as why restrict yourselves to other planets. Maybe there's something about our planet that we want to change. And that's the basis of geoengineering. That's the idea that we're talking about. And so if you look at Oxford Dictionaries, this is, uh, to paraphrase the idea is the deliberate large scale manipulation of an environmental process, um, something that you want to change about the system. Largely, this means global warming. Um, it doesn't need to. It is a more general term than that. So you can think about any aspect of the climate system you might want to change. But because of where we're at in the modern day, this really has taken on the, the meaning of changing global warming, trying to reduce that temperature we talked about earlier. It's generally attributed to a scientist, uh, Paul Crutzen, who I'll mention in a few moments. But there's a lot of earlier works. And I'll try to get to the history behind this in, in a few moments. So Paul Crutzen. Uh, a little bit over 10 years ago, uh, wrote what's now become a rather famous paper, this albedo enhancement by stratospheric sulfur injections, um, a, con a contribution to resolve a policy dilemma. So this caught a lot of attention because Paul Crutzen is a famous scientist. He won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for figuring out the basics of ozone depletion because of CFCs, industrial chemicals, things that we put into the atmosphere. So he wrote this paper in 2006, and he starts out by saying, by far the preferred way to resolve policymakers' dilemma is to lower the emission of greenhouse gases, meaning the obvious solution to global warming is to reduce CO2. He then goes on to say that, although by far not the best solution, um, that there's this proposal that we might do something to the atmosphere, geoengineer the atmosphere, so that we got rid of this temperature effect. His proposal specifically is to put sulfate aerosol into the upper levels of the atmosphere, into the stratosphere, a very stable layer of the atmosphere where things like particles will hang around for about a year's time. He refers to some earlier work, which we'll talk about in a few moments. And then he concludes with, finally, I repeat, the very best would be if emissions of greenhouse gases could be reduced so that this wasn't necessary. Um, I often joke with my students that if they did this on a term paper, I would fail them. If your thesis statement is that you think that the best idea is to get rid of greenhouse gases, and then the body of your paper talks about an alternate solution that you don't think is as good of an idea, and then your conclusions are to say that your original thesis statement was the best idea, that's not a good paper. 
So I guess if you're a Nobel Prize winner, you can get away with this. It has gained a lot of attention. And so this idea came out, which really revisited a lot of earlier papers. Paul Crutzen was not the one to get this started. You can think about works going back into the 1970s where this same idea was proposed. So I want to be very clear about this. This idea of injecting particles is what we just talked about as something that we inadvertently did to our climate system, which has offset some amount of global warming. So there's a warming from greenhouse gases. There's a smaller cooling because of particles and changes in clouds. And so really the idea being put forth here is if a little bit's good, why don't we do more of it to completely interact or out, cancel out that, that large effect? I just want to give you a little bit of perspective about how long ago we started talking about manipulating the temperature of our planet. Uh, this is a report, Restore the Quality of Our Environment. Uh, the Environmental Pollution Panel President's Science Advisory Committee. At the bottom of the page, you see there, 1965. This was the Johnson administration. This is a quote about understanding climate changes may be produced by increasing CO2, but that you could offset this by countervailing, countervailing climatic changes such as raising the albedo of the planet. So it kind of cracks me up when you watch the nightly news and you hear about climate change skeptics and climate change deniers, when in the 1960s, the White House was writing reports about the possibility of changing the climate because of CO2, as well as trying to offset that by something that we did to the, system, the climate system. It turns out by raising albedo, they didn't mean adding particles to the environment. They wanted to change the reflectivity of the planet by throwing ping pong balls into the ocean ping pong balls being rather reflective, ocean water being rather dark. I'm not making this up. So the idea was really to produce these very reflective, very white ping pong balls, spread them over a large surface of the ocean, change the reflectivity of the planet, and, and cool the planet as a result. Now that we're talking about plastic waste in the environment and in the ocean, I wonder how uh, folks would feel about this. Um, it turns out that that report wasn't even the first time this kind of thing was proposed. The basics of climate science actually date back into the late 1800s by uh, Jonathan Tyndall, John Tyndall, and Eunice Foote, Eunice Foote from Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, and Svant Arrhenius, who followed them up, who really did the basics of understanding that carbon dioxide would warm the climate if you put more of it into the climate system. And so people often go, wow, how much foresight was there? These people were thinking about you know, the Industrial Revolution, which was barely 100 years old at this time, and that the planet might get too warm. That's not what they were talking about. Svan Arrhenius was from Sweden. He didn't like the cold winters in Sweden. He wanted to increase the emission of CO2 to warm up the climate system. He wanted to geoengineer a warmer climate in the 1880s so that the planet got more comfortable for him. Um, he wrote a book in 1908 on this topic. It doesn't appear to me that he really thought about what was going to happen in southern Europe or other places that were already warm. Um, he was very much a homer in, in that sense and was really just caring about uh, Scandinavia. Nonetheless, this fits the bill of what geoengineering is. Okay, so, so let's talk about what it is that's being discussed uh, at, by scientists, some scientists and in the media uh, recently. So, so these are geoengineering proposals. Um, there's a whole host of things on here. This is an article by New Scientists, which lays them out graphically. But by and large, you can split them up into two categories. One is carbon capture or carbon sequestration. And this is the idea that there's more CO2 in the atmosphere now than there used to be. Ultimately, what we want to do is pull that CO2 out and return the climate system back to where it was before. Carbon sequestration. You can think of this in a, in a number of different ways. I'll show a few examples uh, later, but it's, it's removing that CO2, taking that 400 parts per million down to 280 parts per million, or a number that we as, as a society decide that, that we want to try to hit. The other geoengineering concept is to change the albedo of our planet. It's often called solar radiation management, or SRM. This is a rebranded name for geoengineering. Um, but I'll try to tell you in a few moments why I think that the correct term for this is albedo modification. So again, the idea behind this, as Paul Crutzen talked about, is to add reflective particles to the atmosphere or change the cloud cover of the planet. More clouds, more reflective particles. The reason that I like the idea of albedo modification, and this is backed up by a recent report from the National Academy of Sciences, is that geoengineering at its heart is not the correct term to use. 
When I say engineering to you, you think about engineering a system, doing something that you want, a likely outcome to the system. By rebranding it as solar radiation management, the folks that are proponents of this use the term management that has the same implication. You manage a system for an end result that you know that you're going to get or that you have a high probability of getting. Albedo modification is really the correct term because we don't really know right now what the result is going to be. There's too much speculation, and I'll try to show that to you. So we can talk about wanting to modify albedo, but not being certain of the consequences of that. So I mentioned that there is this recent report by the National Academy of Sciences. So this is a nonpartisan commission. So as a group in the United States or really internationally, as Congress, anybody can charge the National Academies with a goal. This was something set up by President Lincoln in the 1800s as being sort of a nonpartisan way that we can think of, of solving or addressing different topics. So they were, they were asked uh, in about 2013, uh, the report came out in 2015, I believe, to tackle this idea of geoengineering. Um, the report writers, instead of writing one report on geoengineering, uh, wrote two reports. One was carbon sequestration or carbon dioxide removal. The other one on reflecting sunlight, albedo modification. Um, I like to joke with my students about this as well. If I ask students to produce a term paper for me, I have yet to have a student that gives me two term papers. But that's what these folks did for the National Academies. Well, you have to ask yourself, well, why would they sign on to do that? Why would they write two reports instead of one? Well, the basics behind this are that they felt that these two things that we just talked about were so completely different that there was no way that they could be encompassed in the same report. Removing the carbon dioxide and returning back down a climate ramp that you've been on before with the certainty implied by that was completely different than perturbing the atmosphere in a new way when you're already at a higher carbon state by changing the albedo of the planet. And so for that reason, they said we have to write two reports. So this is part of the synopsis of this. I, I'm breaking the cardinal rule here, which is I'm not supposed to put so much text on the board that you're not going to pay attention to me. But, but look at where the, the blue lines are on here. What they're talking about is carbon dioxide removal strategies generally of being lower risk and almost certain benefit, but that the cost and the readiness level are not there. They're calling for more work on this, and they're saying that you know, for the amount of temperature change that you would get, the return to normalcy, that it would cost quite a bit, a high sort of dollars per ton of carbon canceled out. Whereas albedo modification comes at an unknown environmental price. It might have a rapid effect. We're not quite sure what that effect is, the magnitude of that effect. But it would come at an unknown price. Moreover, uh, not on here, uh, they're talking about how it would be a very cheap solution. And I'll show you more of that later. So it becomes very seductive. You might be able to change, you might be able to change something very rapidly at a low cost, much lower than carbon sequestration or carbon removal. So just a few words on, on carbon sequestration. Uh, this is the idea that you know, either just directly from the atmosphere, you capture that CO2, something that's called direct carbon capture. Um, very energetically unfavorable. Much more likely, much more probable that what you could actually do is grab the carbon out of the stack that's producing it. You know, you, you burn the fossil fuels, you grab that carbon when it's concentrated coming out of the stack, you sequester it back in the earth. The other thing is you can let biology do this for you. You can grow biomass. You might even choose to take some energy out of it. But you find a way to take that carbon down to its most basic form, perhaps like a charcoal and bury it, or combust it all the way to CO2 and then capture that CO2 again at the stack and sequester it. Um, all of these things are uh, being worked on right now, so this is not science fiction. These are all things that are being deployed to some level of readiness right now. Um, but of course, more can be done. Albedo modification, on the other hand, um, is a different story. The idea basically works from the energy balance of the planet. And as I mentioned before, incoming solar radiation, the I solar on here, normally makes it to the surface minus about 30%, which we call the albedo of the planet. So that 70% that makes it to the surface warms the planet. Some of that energy is re-radiated back into the atmosphere, captured by greenhouse gases, and then like a blanket re-radiated to the planet. More greenhouse gases, thicker blanket, warmer temperature. 
If you change that albedo, though, you let less energy into the surface of the planet. So maybe as you're increasing that blanket, you try to increase that sunshade at the same time. So right now, the albedo on the y-axis there is 30%. It's about the same as uh, what deserts are right now. It's actually the integral of all the different surfaces on the planet. Oceans are quite dark. Snow and clouds are quite bright. And so something like the balance is about 30%. The idea is, can we change that? Can we up that albedo? And that's the idea behind albedo modification. So what Paul Crutzen did, and what a lot of these original studies did, is they, they draw from a natural example. So uh, this is Mount Pinatubo going off in uh, the late 1990s. Or, I'm sorry, the early 1990s. This is uh, 1998 is the paper that Alan Robach wrote on this. So uh, Pinatubo uh, uh, hoisted about uh, 15 teragrams of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, which reacted and formed sulfuric acid, which turned into particles. Those particles then dropped the global temperature by about half a degree C for about a year and a half or so. There's a, a folding time as these particles slowly fall out. So it's fairly stable. On average, they're going to live about a year. Some particles are going to get lucky and hang around longer. So you're going to see most of the effects gone after about a year, but some transient effects still there about three years later. These are those particles spreading out. So Pinatubo was in the Philippines. Um, you can see it very rapidly making it around the, the planet uh, in the stratosphere at, at those latitudes, and then sort of slowly spreading polewards um, over the course of the next several months, creating this global effect. And as I mentioned, we saw this change the temperature of the planet. So the observations on here are in black. Um, model results are, are in red. Um, there's some uncertainty in, in those measurements. But what you can see is that the last three major volcanic eruptions, Pinatubo, El Chichon, and Agung, um, all ended up putting material into the stratosphere. That material reflected sunlight. It dropped the temperature. The particles fell out. And then we returned back to sort of the normal temperature of the planet. That's also super, superimposed on a rise that's going on there, and that's global warming. That's anthropogenic warming of, of the planet. Um, some folks might actually remember that uh, we had Mount St. Helens go off in, in the northwest. Mount St. Helens, as large of an explosion, as large of an eruption as we think of it uh, being, was not powerful enough to put a lot of this sulfuric acid material into the stratosphere. Um, and so it didn't have a large temperature effect. It was mostly a local, regional effect instead. So. This is where the direct effect method takes off for albedo modification. Um, so the idea is, say you want to offset the current 0.75 degrees of warming. Well, we've got 15 teragrams doing about 0.5 uh, degrees of, of cooling. So let's put in 20 teragrams of, of sulfuric acid. Half of that's going to fall out a year. So we're going to put 10 more teragrams in the next year, and the next year, and the next year to make up for this. Um, this is actually a, a design that's been proposed. Uh, basically, these are wings that are also balloons that are holding essentially a large garden hose up into the stratosphere. Little holes are poked in it, and you're spraying out sulfuric acid into the stratosphere to create those particles. So you can ask yourself, well, what's the difference from a volcano? Well, the immediate one is that this analogy that geoengineering is like a volcano is absolutely wrong. And the reason is volcanoes are transient. Those are transient signals in the atmosphere. They're gone in a couple of years. Geoengineering at its heart is talking about doing this and then continuing to do it. And I think anybody knows that a step function is different than a transient. So we don't have an example of what happens to the atmosphere from a perturbation like this. There are no volcanoes that leave that particulate loading that high. So it's not an analogy. Initial efforts were cut off. Um, well, this was tried in the UK. They proposed doing experiments like this to see what effect it was going to have. It got cut off because of treaty violations, the idea that you can't just unilaterally spray stuff into the atmosphere and see the effect it has. It dates back to post-Vietnam when things like Agent Orange were being used and countries ratified treaties to not do this type of work. So there's real reasons that this were cut off so that if anything like this was attempted in the future, we would have to see how that was uh, going to play out, how we were going to do that, um, or violate treaties that are in place. I'll briefly mention that there's ideas of changing cloud cover uh, over the surface of the planet as well, um, not changing the stratosphere, but just enhancing clouds. Um, there are some natural cases. These are ship tracks. These are ships uh, off of the coast of uh, France and Spain um, that are not producing smoke, but they're producing sulfur, sulfur dioxide, as a consequence of fossil fuel burning. 
Um, particles are being formed. Uh, there's also diesel particles or, or black carbon particles in some cases coming out. And there's clouds being formed behind them. So folks have actually attempted to do this, attempted to make clouds in the same way. Um, it only works about one in every 10 times. And people haven't quite figured out when that occurs, um, why 10% of the time it works and 90% of the time it doesn't work. So the idea here, if you tried to manipulate clouds, is that you would have a lot of sort of false positives. You would be attempting to do something that wouldn't actually work out. That hasn't happened. Been, or hasn't stopped people from imagining what ships to do this might look like. So that's what's shown in the lower right corner. This is a geoengineering ship. It's going to steam around the world in some way. It's going to suck up seawater. It's going to break it into particles and eject it into the atmosphere. And then clouds are going to form, presumably, on those particles. Um, apparently, only one in every 10 times. It's not clear how much energy it would take to sail these ships around to aerosolize that seawater and to inject it into the atmosphere. Um, but you, you end up with clouds as a result of that. So um, Alan Robach, who uh, also wrote that earlier paper on Mount Pinatubo, wrote a paper in 2008, now about 10 years old, um, talking about the risks uh, as, well, as well as the rewards of this idea of modifying the albedo of, of the planet. And I think he did a really nice job of this. And, and so you, know, you, you do get certain rewards. And this is the type of thing that, that you are going to have to judge if these are important enough. If you put particles in the stratosphere, there is a good probability that you're going to reduce the temperature of the planet. If you increase cloud cover, if you can make clouds effectively, you're going to reduce the temperature of the planet. So that's number one. That's probably going to have the consequence of reversing sea ice loss and sea level rise. So you're probably going to shut those two things down because they're so inherently tied to temperature. There are insufficient studies to say how plants grow under non-direct sunlight. So if you be make sunlight more diffuse or you increase cloud cover, there are studies that show plants don't grow as well. There's not a lot of studies, but there are some studies that say they don't grow as well. You should become a little wary at this point. I do, because number five on the list of rewards is nice sunsets. I don't know if anybody knows this famous picture. Yeah. This is The Scream by Munch. So uh, Munch painted this uh, after uh, the eruption of a volcano in the late 1800s. Um, and as those particles made their way around the world, they diffused a lot of radiation. So what did they do? They changed the way that sunsets looked. So if you look at all the variations of the screen, I'm not sure how many that there actually were that were made. They all have this crazy looking background going on. Um, I guess sunsets are a nice reward. Um, the person in the scream doesn't seem to think so. I, I guess everybody reacts to sunsets, uh, colored sunsets differently. But nonetheless, Alan put that as number five. Um, he also mentioned that perhaps if you change clouds, this would lead us to be able to control precipitation better. Um, that if we know how clouds work, that this might lead us to precipitation control. I'll try to talk about that in a few moments, because this is actually something that falls under the risks as well. So what are the risks? Um, well, if you, put, if you change the temperature of the planet, or you change, especially if you change clouds, you can create regional droughts. So that's the other side of precipitation control. If you change temperature, but you allow carbon to be emitted, carbon dioxide is going to be taken up by seawater, which is ocean acidification. So ocean acidification is not a consequence of geoengineering, but it proceeds unabated because you have only tackled temperature. You have not tackled the carbon problem. So your oceans continue to acidify, and all of the stories you hear about you know, ocean system collapse would go on unabated. Ozone depletion. Uh, after Mount Pinatubo, after volcanic eruptions, when we put particles into the stratosphere, we see ozone go down because of reactions that take place on those particles. Diffuse radiation effects on plants, just like there's studies that say plant productivity would go down, there's a few other studies that say plant productivity goes up. There probably are some plants that grow better with diffuse radiation, things that grow under canopies. There are de definitely plants that grow better with direct beam sunlight. So there's a bit of a mixed bag here. I won't go through all of these, but you can read through all of them. The acid, if you put it into the atmosphere, has to go somewhere. You can change cloud cover in an uncertain way. Number eight is something we'll talk about, lower power margins on solar. 
So if you go to diffuse beam as opposed to direct beam, you change the power margins on photovoltaic and concentrated solar. One of the te technologies that you're looking at to take up the load from fossil fuels becomes less powerful, less likely to work, at least work as well. There's a whole host of other things on there, um, but to use a Donald Rumsfeldism at the end, at the end um, one of the real bugaboos of this is the unknown unknowns, right? I mean, so we can list a whole ton of things, and we could probably come up with more here right now, but there's probably things that could happen that we don't even know about because we're so far from a climate system that we've ever experienced. So I want to just mention a few of, of these side effects um, and problems. So one of the ones that, that has come to light recently, and this is a paper by Miriam Kubler uh, a, a few years ago now, 2012, was that projections of the amount of global cooling that you get from uh, addition of these particles are completely wrong. So why is that? Well, if you change the reflectivity of the stratosphere, that's great. Those are photons now that are bounced back into space. Those are also photons that don't make it down to the clouds that are below that would have otherwise bounced them back to space anyways. So it's called the cloud shielding effect. You lose a little bit of the scattering that you would have had by underlying clouds or ice because you've already done it in the stratosphere. So you've done something that would have happened anyways. It cuts into your margin by about 30 some percent. So most projections of geoengineering cooling are about 30% too high. And that was shown a few years ago. Um, but unfortunately, proponents have not picked this up. And they continue to write uh, the values as if they just turned down the sun, for example, as opposed to thinking about those underlying clouds. This is a paper by Dan Murphy. And so in this, he shows for concentrated solar power, the type of thing going on in places like Arizona, thought of for concentrating solar energy, melting salts, that type of thing, that the loss of direct beam actually cuts into the margins so much that this becomes an ineffective technology. It certainly works in the same way for photovoltaic by reducing the amount of energy that's produced. Precipitation changes. If you put those particles in the stratosphere, one of the things we started talking about is that as we change particles on the surface of the planet, they make their way into the atmosphere. They find their way into clouds as the seeds on those clouds. If you put those particles in the stratosphere, they have to fall out. What do they do? They change cloud properties. That's not one of the things that's modeled. Um, this was a, a work of Jones in, in 2010 looking at precipitation changes. This is from stratospheric sulfate. This is from changes in marine clouds, these salter ships that I showed you earlier. Um, under zero is a drought. Does anybody see where a large drought is happening when you change marine clouds, which exist off of the west coast of South America? That's the Amazon rainforest. Um, that's a little important for the oxygen budget of the planet. And so you induce droughts in cases like this. I mentioned that there's good knowledge from the ozone hole days, work that Paul Crutzen did himself, that particles in the stratosphere act as sites on which chemical reactions take place that chew up ozone. So these are all of the different materials that do that. I'll call your attention to uh, a few of these things. So these are nitric uh, acid and water, sulfuric acid and water, ices. Um, a lot of these are hydrates of materials, nitric acid, trihydrate, dihydrate, sulfuric acid, tri uh, dihydrates, tri trihydrates, and so on. So we actually saw this. So this is ozone after Pinatubo. Um, so on the left-hand plot, this is ozone uh, at the top before Pinatubo went off, measurements from satellites. Pinatubo goes off, it puts those particles into the stratosphere. Satellites measure ozone going down over, a period, uh, over the time period after those particles are present. So if you were to put sulfur sulfuric acid, sulfate material into the stratosphere, we know from Pinatubo, from other measurements, that ozone would go down as a result. So recently, uh, some scientists up the river, uh, this is David Keith, uh, uh, Frank Koich, and, and John Dykema, as well as others, proposed that maybe we could put materials that are reflective but that don't deplete ozone into the stratosphere. So they proposed putting in something like calcium carbonate, um, which would react with different chemicals, some of these acids, and perhaps pull out sulfuric acid or nitric acid in this series of chemical reactions. So bingo, everything is solved. You've got a reactive particle that doesn't deplete ozone. The other side effects we talked about are still going to come into play. 
Um, the problem is that they didn't acknowledge what the proper phase of those materials were in the stratosphere. So we're in a room right now. Um, there is a dihydrate of calcium sulfate all around you. It's called gypsum. It makes drywall. Dihydrate of calcium sulfate. The stable form of all of the materials on the right-hand side in here are hydrates or liquids in the stratosphere. Those are hydrates in the stratosphere depleting ozone. So the idea that you form these anhydrous materials that reflect energy back into space but don't deplete ozone is not correct. There's actually a long literature of this. This is from uh, industrial work for the production of gypsum, where people look at the reactivity of these surfaces. Um, these are the well-known phase relationships, the hydrate formations of things like calcium sulfate, and the hydration of calcium nitrate. So a lot of these sort of miracle particles that are going to reflect radiation but not do anything to ozone um, actually don't exist in that form whatsoever. Um, and it's uh, actually kind of stunning that this was missed in, in a paper that's cited as often as that one is. Um, I should mention a lot of this work on, on hydrates at low temperatures and low pressures is actually also known from studies of the Martian atmosphere, um, which again was completely missed by the authors of that paper. So to start to wrap up, uh, to use my last few minutes, uh, this is part of that National Academy's report um, about the benefits and costs of carbon dioxide removal proposals and the benefits and costs of albedo modification proposals. Um, to sum up, I'm going to say something that I said earlier. Carbon dioxide removal proposals, probably pretty costly per ton of carbon, but we've, we've seen our climate system ramp up from 280 to 400 parts per million carbon. If we remove it, we have a pretty good understanding of going back down that ramp. Now, there might be switches that were flipped. There might be jumps. There might be nonlinearities that would happen. I'm not discounting that. That certainly could happen. But walking back down that ramp is a lot more certain than going into a completely unknown part of the system or part of our climate system, high particle loadings, high CO2. Albedo modification, though, is seductive. It's incredibly cheap. You might get a lot of bang for your buck. You might get real temperature reduction um, for a very small amount of money. And so that's something that has to be uh, sort of factored into the equation. So just to make one final point, and then I'm going to turn it over to you guys for some questions and questions that I would like to ask you because I don't have all of the answers. Um, I'd like you to understand the climate that we're living in, not the temperature climate, but the political climate. And I try to stay away from politics as much as I can, especially in class. But I think for a forum like this, you guys have to be aware of what's going on. This is a direct quote from uh, Republican Lamar Smith, um, who is retiring, uh, actually, I believe at the end of this year. 2012, I believe climate change is due to a combination of factors, including natural cycles, sunspots, and human activity. The figure that I showed you earlier shows scientists clearly showing that natural variability is not to blame for temperature rise. That is not true. That is not scientific. There is no basis for that. It is only the third thing on there. It is only human activity. I shouldn't say it's only, but the vast majority of it's human activity. You saw the size of the error bars. You saw the size of the effect that's been calculated. Fast forward to last fall, when people went in front of Congress and talked about geoengineering. Lamar Smith says geoengineering is worth exploring and that the technology could have positive effects on the Earth's atmosphere, such as reducing global temperatures. When asked why geoengineering should be considered, the purpose of this hearing is to discuss the viability of geoengineering. The hearing is not to pl a platform to further debate about to a further debate about climate science or climate change. So you have one of the leading political skeptics of climate saying that we should explore geoengineering as a way to offset this temperature rise that apparently is not due to us, but is instead natural, in his opinion, at the heart of this. So you guys need to be aware of this, that although there is science behind this, the idea of that we have come to some decision about what to do with this technology is, is not in place whatsoever. And I think this is a great fear and one that folks should be that, that folks should have is that you could mask a temperature rise, you could mask the emission of fossil fuels by doing something else to the atmosphere instead of looking at what the underlying problem is, the release of those emissions and the removal of, of the products from the atmosphere. So I'm going to ask you a number of questions because I don't have answers to these. How much are you willing to pay for the solution to climate change? Do you want the more costly one or, or the cheaper one? <laughs> 
Have we shown that the cure is better than the disease? Are we, are we willing to say that the masking of a temperature rise is really better than the side effects? Is masking temperature rise really the same as inadvertent modification of climate, the global warming that we already have in place? Um, something that we didn't have a, t a chance to talk about tonight is, um, are, you, are, you, are you comfortable with models of what climate is going to do in the future? We have models that say weather modification works, but no scientific basis to show that that's the case. And then finally, if this is a last resort, if, if you know, we're so stuck that temperature has gone up, um, you know, five years, 10 years in the future, we see this huge spike in temperature, uh, are we confident that this is going to work out? So, I don't have all the answers. Um, I personally, and again, this is my opinion. Um, luckily, I'm the person at the front of the room, but I, I'm willing to stay around as long as you like to tell me your opinion. Uh, that's the format that we're in. There are non-starters for me as a scientist here. If you talk about uh, creating droughts in areas or floods in areas, I'm not OK with that. Um, if you're talking about climate winners and losers, I'm not OK with that. Um, certainly, if you change ozone, I am not OK with that. If you increase the rate, for example, of human skin cancers as a result. Those, for me, are all non-starters. I'm willing to pay more money to do the research to look at carbon sequestration as opposed to albedo modification. But everybody has a different set point. Everybody's going to feel differently. Maybe two of those things are not non-starters for you. Maybe there's more non-starters for you. That's for everybody to decide. So hopefully I've tried to lay out the case both ways. And, and you, know, you may come to a, a, an opinion that's different than mine. And I'm going to respect that opinion. Um, but hopefully you have the scientific basis behind that now. So thank you guys for your time. And I will take any questions you've got.